Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Mission Oriented Innovation Boot Camp Refresher. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kara Bleckenwigner. I work on Mission Oriented Innovation at the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. And the two speakers today will be Raina Kato, Deputy Director and Professor of Innovation at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and Kara Tonaris, Lead on Systems Thinking and Innovation Governance at the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Um, this webinar is a refresher of the mission-oriented innovation bootcamp that we held in December. So it is aimed at people who miss the bootcamp or would like a recap on the content. So in the webinar, we will run through the key takeaways from the bootcamp and provide space for discussion and your questions at the end. Of course, you can also rewatch the whole bootcamp on YouTube and the link will be pasted in the Zoom chat. And so today we will start with a 30 minute quick fire summary of the main ideas from the bootcamp. Then there will be a discussion between Parrot and Reiner of the key insights from the bootcamp. And at the end, we'll open it up to questions. A few technicalities at first. Please feel free to post your comments and questions in the chat throughout the webinar. The webinar is recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. And um, of course, we'll share the slides presented today with you by email. If you're interested in following our work on missions beyond the webinar, we will run a mission simulation workshop next month. It will focus on operationalizing missions and testing different policy approaches. Unfortunately, because we are very oversubscribed, this event is invite only, but we will write up the simulations into a report that will be publicly available. In the meantime, if you are working on mission-oriented innovation and testing different approaches on the ground, we would love to hear from you. Um, if you're interested in sharing your experiences, you can sign up through a Google form on the Zoom chat and we will get in touch. Now, without further ado, I'll set some context. The Mission Oriented Innovation Bootcamp in December was a joint event between OECD OPSI and the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And it brought together IAPP's Mission Oriented Innovation Network, um, government institutions, academics, and interested individuals from 36 countries um, to explore challenges and opportunities of directing mission-oriented innovation. And we had fantastic interest with over 150 participants. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Reiner to start us off on the quick recap. Hello, everybody. And I'm really delighted to see, again, so many participants. Uh, joining us today, and um, this is a uh, second um, event or a refresher, as it were, and I'm really glad um, that our cooperation with OSCD obviously has been so uh, fruitful and nice. And yes, and, and we, we try to keep it quite um, relaxed uh, because it's a refresher, so the event already took place, so we're just sort of summarizing what happened. So if you have questions, comments, just keep them coming on the, on the, on the chat line that we can maybe address them even as we go along if there's something that uh, that really um, addresses it yeah so from from our side we are institute for innovation and public purpose at ucl we are founded and directed by mariana mazzucato and um and we are um, slightly more than three years old so we're still a relatively new institution but we are um, a at the crossroads as it were of economics governance public policy design technology innovation so we are we're an institute that tries to really uh, focus on um, on the way economic growth uh, takes place and what the role that especially the governments can play in directing the economic growth towards more equitable and green outcomes. Next, next slide, please. Um, and as Chiara already said, we have our our mission oriented innovation network. Um, the OECD is one of our key partners, helping it grow and develop. And this is a global um, organizations uh, or the you know 
organizations from all, all, all over the world. And there is also a Nora Clinton you can see on the on the chat here. So if you are interested in more information about the, our Mission Oriented Innovation Network, you can um, get in touch with Nora and get more information um, as well. Please, next slide. And, and of course, um, as uh, Chiara here has graduated, graduated from our program, uh, master's degree, uh, so you can also join uh, uh, our, our MPA program on innovation, public policy, and public value. Admissions are now open. So if you or your colleagues might be interested in that, please share it. And uh, our MPA is really tackling these same issues that we're discussing today, uh, but in more detail. So um, again, if you have any interest uh, whatsoever, any questions, just show us. And of course, um, uh, doing more promotion this week in that sense is very significant. It's a good week to do a, a refresher on mission, mission or innovation because Mariana publishes this week a new book on mission economy. So again, these are the issues that we're just discussing today are now in a book forum. You can pre-order it, um, especially if you're in, uh, in, in UK, I think it comes out already later this week. Um, so uh, next slide. So just to summarize uh, what we discussed and what Mariana, Mariana discussed, in our December get together, this was really to, to try to um, focus or, or yeah, reflect on what 2020 meant for a mission oriented innovation. Because if you look uh, back uh, over the last five to seven years, you see many countries sort of edging towards uh, this idea of more challenge led growth. The growth is not, you know, economic growth in itself is, is, is not just not enough. We need to have a discussion about the quality of growth growth, uh, especially towards uh, the green and more sustainable economies. But this was really the year uh, 2020 when this became in, into focus for many countries because of COVID, of course. And also, I think many governments were perhaps surprised by their own uh, powers and abilities to deliver a, 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 a very quick uh, recovery uh, plan and actually get together people around this, uh, the same table and, and really to change uh, what happened in the economy. So some countries dealing with uh, dealing with this challenge better than others. But I think it, it again brought us into the focus, this idea that the government should be uh, uh, focusing on shaping the economy and directing the economy in the, towards the outcomes uh, we all want is something that uh, COVID, I think, brought us home. And, and from our perspective, this is really, it's not only about uh, concepts and policies, but it's also the language we use when we talk about government so that we don't think of government as something that is always reactive, reacting to the, to the economy, the initiative from the private sector, but that the government itself, of course, can also welcome uncertainty, take risks, and, and take a very long-term uh, view uh, on things as well, and uh, building the direction as it were. So let's go on. Um, and I think the, what, uh, what we discussed uh, in, the, in the December, meeting was really that the missions are a way for governments to to focus not only just delivering growth but actually a specific kind of growth so when we think about the growth that is more equitable and uh, more green missions provide a way to do that they provide a new policy framing framing as, as it were and to reorganize policy making almost and this is what uh, why i think especially in the european union uh, context uh, european commission but also many member states have been very keen on applying this idea of uh, yes, we can all agree on grand challenges, but so how do we actually implement that in real life? So how do we go away from siloed way of government where we have you know Department of Health, Department of um, Energy, all of them working on their own, but how do we get them to work together and how do we, how do we get them to work together, especially with private sector as well towards a common goal? And I think mission, well-framed missions provide exactly this opportunity for government to have a, a common ground, a common goal to work towards. And these are these uh, reports that the uh, European Commission um, has put out with, uh, with Mariana's authorship and, and our wider help. And let's go forward. Um, so the, the, really the key, uh, I think in, in, sen in a sense of of uh, almost like a philosophical change or ideological change from the way governments see themselves is really to, to go uh, 
uh, or not, not only to focus on what are the failures in our current systems, in our current markets, where is the private sector is not active enough, where can we help private sector, but actually take a longer term and more substantive view and saying where we actually, we as a government need to take this very hands-on, very dynamic approach in trying to shape the future markets in, in, in mobility, in food, fashion, clothing, all of those areas there uh, where governments perhaps are not usually seen as, as key actors and shapers. So yes, we need to understand the failures as well and fix them, of course, but we need to go beyond and to devise tools that provides us um, much more active uh, ways to, to shape markets, as it were. And so, because reality in itself is not only a failure, but the reality, of course, we want the reality to be something better than just a, a bunch of failures. Um, and we want to be uh, reality to be happier, more equitable, and more green, I guess. And yeah, let's go on. And yeah, this is from the European Commission report that Mariana wrote and um, by now, two years ago, and that really lies at the heart of European Commission's approach to the mission. So, there's these five criteria. And I think the, all of them uh, carry uh, themselves really key messages. I think about, uh, in, you know, the missions really should be inspirational. So they can't be just a percentage of, you know, so many countries are, are focusing on missions as a percentage of, you know, trying to re reduce carbon um, uh, content of the economy, for instance, by 70%, which, sounds, which is very ambitious, but it doesn't actually tell a person on the street anything really. But it doesn't actually motivate uh, so much. So I think the uh, challenge for governments is to find a way to actually frame missions and mission oriented policies that are actually understandable for a wider audiences or wider segments of population and citizens. And so this is where the idea of Paul and inspirational is so relevant, but also to, have to, to be at the same time clear and targeted. So this 70% in itself is, is a great target. So, but how do we communicate that to the wider wider uh, segments of, of uh, population is I think something that uh, many governments are, are grappling with. And also that they need to include the investment into recent you know, innovation. And, and the, the really the key bit I think is that the mission should be more cross-sectoral and cross-disciplinary. So not only around technology or specific technologies or like energy technology, but also include the behavioral aspects of the way we eat, the way we uh, commute, and, and the way we dress um, and, and, and things like that. So I think this uh, behavioral aspects are, are, are really key as well. And also this last um, point about missions in this report is that um, missions should be not only focused on one solution and, or, or one energy carrier system, if you will, but really have a multiple investments into multiple solutions that can be then driven by private sector or universities or or NGOs and, and so forth. So to actually galvanize a wider uh, search for solutions, I think this is really the key here, that uh, government is not the one who says, this is the solution for our problem, but it's actually enabling this space for solutions to be found by multiple actors or trying to look for them. Uh, next, please. And something that uh, we have been working on um, is, is this idea of raw framework, which is basically trying to gather these key issues together into, into the policy uh, framework. And, uh, um, and this has these four elements, basically exactly that. The first is, is really the, the question about the direction for the economic growth or the policies. You know, what, is the, uh, what is the more specific uh, direction we want to go towards? Is it, is it just green growth or is it a specific uh, to our context. So how do you contextualize these uh, SDGs kind of challenges? But also how do you build up a public organizations that are then able to go move away from an organization like a typical innovation agency today will just give you a grant or give you a, a, a some sort of a, a support key scheme, maybe a loan, but actually not themselves being not very innovative. So how do we change this culture in the public sector as well? What are the capabilities and capacities needed also, how do you um, evaluate and assess something that is um, meant to really change the market in itself? And uh, so how do you assess something that is, is not um, simply about costs and benefits, but it's also actually creating a new market. So how do you evaluate something that, that is in, in, in itself a uh, uh, very complex uh, thing to evaluate? So 
how do public organizations actually develop these new methodologies is something that we're really interested. In. And of course, the, the idea of risk and the rewards, uh, who get who invests and who gets the rewards is really important as you see during COVID at the moment, uh, the, uh, the race towards vaccines and who actually benefits and how and the, uh, the vaccine nationalism is something that we are uh, uh, many, many countries are today facing. So this is entire sort of set, issue, set of issues around um, missions that we think that the uh, war framework is um, is providing an answer for. Next, please. Oh, next is already brought. Here we go. Thank you so much, uh, Rainer. So great compliments to IIPP and UCL for really ad advancing the kind of the theoretical knowledge about what is going on in the field of missions and how to actually make missions work. So we at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, our main interest is also on how to actually make uh, missions operational and accessible to also civil servants and public servants. So there is uh, a really a big uh, question around is mission something that only politicians can set or is top down from a police political action or is there also kind of a mission setting role for civil servants. So preparing missions and actually setting missions uh, is kind of a, you know, you need methods and working methods to actually do that. So we are, have been working together with different governments and you see the picture of the Estonian government, kind of the highest level civil service where they are uh, developing missions and also pitching them uh, using uh, a resource that we have developed called the mission planning canvas that we're also going to share uh, with the wider community uh, this session. So we are also very much interested in developing solid context aware methodologies to actually work with missions. If we go forward, then uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, developed a kind of a innovation facets model where in the context of where we are actually looking at missions. So missions, uh, mission-oriented innovation is not the only type of innovation that governments should support. Uh, there are also other different types of uh, sources for innovation that can also support missions. So you can anticipate or you have your kind of futures or foresight outlook where you can actually pick up new and upcoming challenges about what is might be upcoming in your welfare systems within your environmental systems that can pick up topics that you need actually setting up new high level goals and uh, missions that the government should be supporting and working on. Uh, you also have to have enhancement oriented innovation because you potentially, uh, aside from creating new structures in government for missions, you may also need to enhance your current systems to actually deal with the demands set for these goals. And you also need to create uh, space for adaption. So for kind of bottom up, uh, uh, on the ground uh, innovations that may come up and may also support your uh, problem or your mission that you want to solve. Moving forward, we also asked from our Dece uh, in December what the expertise in missions from the audience were. And a lot of the people were new to the topic, but uh, many people also had knowledge, but little practical experience. And uh, kind of a th third of the group also had knowledge and practical experience uh, from the missions. So we also want to ask a similar question from you, from the audience. And for that, we are also asking you to uh, go on WooClap. Uh, our elves in the background are going to share the link in the chat. So uh, go on your smartphone or your uh, computer, go to www.wooclap.com com slash mission refresh. So also uh, someone from our team is going to put that one uh, link onto our chat and you can go there directly. And then we can also uh, ask some questions from you throughout the, the webinar. So hopefully you will also get that link in the chat and I think we can move onward to the question. So our question is going to be, how would you rank your expertise within the missions as well? So we'd like to know, based on the people we had in our groups in December, uh, what has kind of changed? Or do we have increased knowledge about the uh, missions? And if we have a mission expert in the room as well?
So comments coming in and quite similarly, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, missions, uh, people who have knowledge about the new approaches that are upcoming, but not a lot of experience yet. And there are also people that are totally new to the topic. I'm giving another couple of minutes uh, or a minute uh, to for the answers to come in. And keep uh, log yourself logged on to WooClap because we have a couple of other questions that we want to ask from you. So no mission expert in the room yet. Very good. So uh, we have still work to do uh, to reach that expertise level. We at the observatory would not call ourselves experts or mission experts yet, because uh, the kind of the beauty of mission-oriented innovation approach is that every single missing mission is going to be slightly different due to the context and the, uh, the work that you're doing. And we at the OECD, in a broader sense, we are also uh, looking into the emerging mission-oriented innovation practice about what is going on on the ground. So we have work done by STI, uh, Science, Technology and Industry Directorate on designing uh, and implementing mission-oriented uh, policies, especially in research and innovation. And findings from that uh, report uh, are um, that we also discussed in December was indeed the kind of the growing role of uh, mission-oriented innovation policies within member countries. Um, but there are some buts and challenges connected to that. So there are uh, some new policies that uh, are already uh, taken that need a little bit uh, help in actually defining them how missions work. So missions become more specific uh, over time, uh, but you should also avoid mission washing. So you should also avoid uh, um, kind of redefining your current policies in the line of a mission. So using old tools or old methods towards uh, not working in its entirety. So missions require governance redesign in terms of how you work, in terms of cross policy, cross ministerial approaches, so because some of these problems uh, may cross also um, the different ministries and structures and systems that we have built up before. And you can uh, access some of these resources from the OECD library, uh, especially mission oriented innovation policies with the uh, uh, link below. And we hope that uh, especially for innovation policies and missions connected to that, we can also, uh, there's also going to be a working paper out soon from our partners from SDI. And again, if you're interested in participating in the work that we're doing and the research that we're doing in developing action-oriented tools for mission, please let us know uh, on the, about your ongoing work and uh, on mission-oriented innovation and join the kind of uh, uh, collective practice that we are all following at the OECD. Yeah, so we, we now, um... I bring you uh, some of the examples we discussed. Uh, we had presentations in December from from four um, uh, participants. Uh, they they talked about their own um, work and experience with the setting up missions and uh, what are the successes and and not so successes uh, as it were. So we'll um, I will now um, for uh, for next ten minutes I will I will become uh, Dan Hill and <laughs> and I will, I will try to impersonate his uh, his fantastic presentation. Uh, not 10 minutes, but uh, five minutes. So Tan was talking about um, exactly Vinova. I see Jan Breitinger uh, already asked in the in the Q&A about Vinova. So I think it's, an, it's a really interesting example where Vinova tried to do exactly this more bottom-up approach. So they tried to engage a, a lot of uh, uh, citizens in various meetings, workshops, and really try to think about actually two missions or two areas for missions. One is about healthy and sustainable food and the other is about uh, sustainable mobility. I think especially the food one is perhaps might come as a surprise for some because we all think of, always think about energy and mobility when we think about green. Uh, but um, as you might know, in many of the countries, food in itself is actually one of the largest producers of carbon. So if you can't decarbonize, as it were, our food habits, 
you can actually change quite a lot. And in Sweden, for instance, government pays for half of the lunches every day in schools and, and public cafeterias and so forth. So government has already an enormous lever, enormous financial lever of changing the, the food value chain. And I think this is a, a really interesting way of looking at missions is and how do we decarbonize food? And, um, and if you go on at the next slide, uh, I think yeah, this is looks at the street, but that, that they did the same thing with the food to understand it. If you look at, you know, if you want to today, if you want to have a, a sustainable tea in, with your uh, with our seminar today, you know, if you look at tea bag around this tea bag, this is an enormous industrial system, you know, from producing energy to the waste systems, but you know, it, it is captured in this one tea bag, and and how do you make that sustainable? So if if you say that. Whole, all publicly funded lunches in Sweden should be sustainable. You right away create this enormous task for various public agencies to get together, but also for funding agencies to actually rethink what do we fund, how do we fund, and at the same time, of course, everybody in their, you know, with their families can, can very easily understand. Of course, I want my uh, my child to have a healthy school lunch today. So if you can make that happen. It's great. So it's it's a, it's a very you know very successful communication tool as well. I think. But what they what they're in really well is to to show how you know missions have to be focusing on a very visible thing such as street or food. So how do we change that this experience of street or food rather than just saying that we will fund something over the next 10, 15 years, which as I said before might not be so uh, directly linked to my objective experience as a citizen in Sweden or, or somewhere else. So I think this is, um, you know, the understanding the systems behind it and saying that, you know, we want to have, we want to choose the focal point of a mission for those systems is something that is uh, is really powerful, I think, in what they do in Sweden. And while the, the school lunch is about, it's one mission, but the other one is that every street should be, um, um, should be livable in Sweden in that sense that it has a nice experience as they as live on, on the street. And next slide, please. And um, this, I think, led to, to this massive, uh, sort of trying to massively engage various, um, not just partners rep who represent institutions, but actually people um, on the on the policy design or the collaborative design workshops. I think that they ran are really interesting, and so they got um, you know school children involved, but also prime minister. So if you have a, around similar table, a a prime minister and a, a, a school um, a group of school school children talking about uh, lunches in school, I think is a very powerful way of trying to design missions. So they're not uh, just bottom up, but they're not only uh, top down either. Next slide, please. And and I think, yeah, this, so this is the idea of, uh, of rather the planning for the you know, long-term policy changes taking uh, years and years, uh, what they did in Sweden, they tried to do you know very quick prototypes of this is what we mean by changing the, the nature of streets. So how do we, Essentially, how do we get uh, less cars on the street, but also how do we put more uh, life on the street? How do we put uh, you know more businesses, more interactions, especially between various uh, people and businesses on the street? And so this is how they design those uh, you know sustainable ways of of using your uh, cycle bicycles and parking them, and that should lead to more interaction. People can sit, like can actually be on the street rather than using it from a a, a sort of getting to uh, point A to point B. And I think in that sense, the innovation agency itself changes quite uh, radically because it's not only giving somebody else money to do something with that money and be more sustainable, for instance, but it's actually saying, well, how can we ourselves be more innovative in what we do? How do we work with our various uh, stakeholders? And how do we actually engage with the citizens? And how do we keep this bottom up innovation ideas coming forward? I think, I think that this is what they did did really, really well in, in this example. Uh, and we go on to um, to Spain. So I'm now becoming Jordi and uh, from Spain and also a national innovation agency, ANISA. And, and similarly, I think the, uh, uh, to Vinova, it is an attempt from an innovation agency, not, not just to, uh, to, to fund missions, but actually to become a different agent uh, in the innovation system, to be more active, in terms of coordinating and how do you get uh, different ministries and, and agencies um, to focus uh, around similar goals is, is what they did, I think, really interestingly. 
and uh, go to the next slide, please. And again, I think what is really interesting is, is you see here the tracking uh, mobility. So the, how do we actually agree on a, on a goal that, that makes sense for um, in terms of investment, but also in terms of for people who are then, um, you know, should, should be able to enjoy those outcomes. And so they want to increase the sustainable mobility, but at the same time, reduce the aggregate mobility so that you, you become the, you know, you don't lose the quality of life, but at the same time, the, the options for services and also work would actually increase without you having to uh, co place it. So it's uh, making city as it were smaller and more compact and at the same time with a less carbon intensive um, footprint. So I think it's, a, it's another really interesting example of, of what missions can do for you is if you, 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 know, you calvinize around those really important goals, but also uh, thinking about how do we frame those goals so that you know, people in, the, in, the, in, the, in the public organizations, but also on the street understand what are we trying to do here from the government side. So it's again showing that this idea of, uh, of coordination through missions is, is something that is, is also powerful. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Jan, you asked about Germany and, and Germany uses missions somewhat similarly as a, as a tool to coordinate those various ministries uh, on the federal, but also the level of uh, uh, states. So this is a, an example and uh, on we go to Pierre. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rainer. So we also asked uh, during the bootcamp uh, why missions actually resonate uh, with you. Why is it needed? So what kind of challenges or problems that you see coming up today? So we went from, we had very, very complex input from the group from uh, climate change to health issues to welfare state changes to technological challenges that are upcoming. So this is also something that uh, we want to ask from you. So we want to analyze if the results of the December uh, um, bootcamp are different from the ones that we receive now. So tell us what is on your mind at the moment, uh, which mission challenges most resonate with you? So which kind of mission would you want to commit to today? Uh, you can also, of course, uh, one of the biggest challenges of all is climate change and one of the uh, votes and you can also see the link above uh, you can go to the same link uh, www.wooklab.com national commissions refresh we can see gender pay cap uh, smart cities affordable housing corruption bureaucracy sustainable um, development and green cities, aging, biodiversity. As you can see that there is actually quite a lot of room for missions. So there are quite a lot of problems that we are not actually very happy that we haven't solved in the public sector. And we need to change uh, our operating models and set new goals to make it work. So if you open the kind of the requests for issues that are out there, then you can see democracy and bureaucracy and uh, delivery of services and also post COVID-19 world. So I think that all of these are ripe for kind of a mission oriented approach to actually ch achieve all the goals that Reiner was talking about as well. And of course, the kind of the new uh, big challenge of uh, climate change that is upcoming. And now I'm going to also take on uh, the role of Hannah this time from uh, uh, from the agency of uh, Health Holland and the mission driven innovation policy in the Netherlands that, that they were talking about uh, to us about. And this is really about uh, in, by 2040, uh, all Dutch citizens uh, will live at least five years longer in good health. Uh, uh, this was the mission that was set by policymakers for Health Holland and Health Holland has taken up. So this is really about the setting and getting that mission and how to actually make that work. So below that mission, they have set the four different sub goals. And one of the key takeaways from the case study as well is that when you start to actually implement this kind of complex systems around giving people more productive life years, uh, then you are unable to do it with a simple hackathon or a simple challenge uh, or a challenge oriented approach, which was one of the questions connected to the 
this can be, of course, part of it. Uh, but changing human behavior towards these very complex issues, this is a one-time challenge or static uh, uh, trial is not going to solve it. So what they saw in the case of uh, Health Holland was they needed different domains from dementia, chronic conditions, lifestyle and social care issues, and actually design a participatory experimental process uh, in different also regional contexts uh, that would take that into account and would deliver uh, towards that mission. Uh, with the goal as well is that um, some of these trials and experiments uh, will not work in practice. So mission is an ongoing thing. So you need to also reframe uh, after you set your initial goal and activities, you have to also have the ability to reframe your actions on the goal. And they also took a kind of a systems uh, approach uh, towards kind of system landscapes about how the context of health overall looked like uh, and uh, the niches uh, of different activities that needed to approach. So you need to really gain the commitment of many organizations, communities on multiple levels to build that momentum. And one of the key questions in the public sector is as well is that if your role within the system is on an agency level, for example, or you're entering from a sector or ministry, for example, how are you going to actually get the mandate and the legitimacy to lead those activities and those networks beyond your single organization? So where do you get actually the legitimacy to do that? And this is also something that can be addressed tools, mechanisms uh, that uh, can set up those uh, collaborative networks and ambitions themselves. And if we move uh, forward, then we also see that uh, Gerard uh, from the Royal Academy of Engineering was uh, actually presenting a very interesting approach and a very interesting question in December about uh, what uh, type, uh, how much do you actually need to commit to a mission? So they're working with very different uh, networks of engineers, academics, business leaders that they need to bring together to actually uh, deliver on very complex uh, missions. But one of the key takeaways from that as well for the success criteria is to not overcommit too much upfront. So actually make these kind of action plans and uh, uh, or operational plans for missions, uh, but you shouldn't overcommit too early. So you should actually explore what is possible and understanding and the capabilities that are out there in the system that need to be maybe nudged in different ways to actually make the mission um, reach its goals. So these are, these are the kind of the, you know, you have a mission oriented approach where you have a very concrete goal, but a very flexible approach or a dynamic approach below that. And that was also very similar to the work that uh, Dan Hill in Vinnova has been doing as kind of developing a design approach to, to missions. And uh, we also see that uh, you have to be extremely inclusive about the community of the willing that you uh, start building to listen to underrepresented voices and uh, also leveraging networks towards those uh, missions themselves. So one of the mission then dangers that we see at least in our practice is the lock-in effect. So if you start to only kind of talking to the people and that are connected to the core teams or the mission approaches or the goals, then you may actually miss out on key uh, different action points that actually can help you deliver on the missions themselves. Giving it over to Chiara who will take us to discussion. Thank you, Reiner and Tered for a very fast recap of what we discussed during the bootcamp. We'll uh, jump ahead in the time. Um, in the last hour of the bootcamp, we asked participants to break into discussion groups. They discussed four key areas of discussion in missions. How do you set a mission? How do you fund missions? What capabilities do you need to implement missions? And how can you evaluate missions? The goal of the groups was really to gather questions and discuss challenges because we recognize there are no right answers or best practices in missions yet. They are only emerging as they're being implemented. For this part of the webinar, we will talk about the key takeaways. Um, the first being that 
missions demonstrate the need to change existing policy frameworks. Throughout the examples, we have seen that staying in our old circles and old approaches will not lead to different outcomes. Mission practice is therefore very diverse, and we are at the stage where we need to try different experimental approaches. And this is what this webinar and the collaboration between OECD and OPC is aiming for, to learn from emerging practices from your work on mission-oriented innovation and develop peer learning communities. For the next part, I'll invite Reiner and Parrot to have a discussion about the main emerging questions from the seminar. Thank you, Chiara. Okay. So we've, I've been trying to, I've been trying to reply to questions in a, in a Q and A as well. So, um, so I think you can um, can see them uh, there as well. Um, so I I can just uh, do a quick story. I think what we what we saw in the seminar and uh, and, and also in the ongoing work we're, we're doing, there is a really interesting diversity of mission practices. So missions can be really, you know, heavily political, as it, you know, in the case of the European Commission, for instance, is very much a political process. But at the same time, if you look at, for instance, uh, we know why in Sweden it's very much a bottom up, uh, driven by a public organization, but then it can also be driven by a Royal Engineering Society, which is not a public organization, but a, a, a third sector organization, and they can take it on as well. And somebody asks about challenge prizes, for instance, and indeed you can you can see that uh, philanthropies um, are playing a, an incredibly important role in, in using this kind of approach in, in, in medicine uh, in, the, in the global south as well. So I think there is a there's a multiple ways of doing that. And I think we're all learning as we go along. And this is really what we're trying to do here in these seminars, but also in our cooperation with, uh, uh, with OSCD OPSI in general to, to learn from the practice rather than say that there is one best way of doing it. Uh, one of the key emerging questions from the discussion was, for example, how do perspectives on missions differ between actors in the innovation chain or between actors on different levels? Perth, mm -hmm. maybe you can comment first on that one. So I'm going to put my kind of systems bias in uh, um, on the table as well is that uh, all your actors within your mission will not perceive the mission in the same way. So uh, it, that's why it's also important to kind of have a clear and understandable mission, like not too complex about uh, having uh, re reducing uh, carbon uh, emissions by 10% by this state. It, this doesn't really talk to different partners from different sectors. So you have to have a simple mission to do that. Uh, but even if you have the greatest, the most clearest mission statement, it still means that different people from different organizations are going to view it differently and see their role within it differently. So when you are actually looking at these different levels and your roles and ministries roles, and then it would be important to have a kind of coordinating responsibility of someone to actually coordinate the mission, be it bottom up or top down. Uh, and uh, then to start really uh, analyze the system, which kind of organizations uh, and the stakeholders, internal and external to public sector, are key to actually delivering on that mission. And what is my role as a kind of leader or owner of that mission, or really kind of uh, the one that is responsible or interested party in getting that mission done? How am I going to convince all their differing interests uh, to get those uh, to those mission goals? And then you'll probably have to push different types of buttons and talk to about different motivations uh, connected to those different partners. Because ministries usually, unfortunately, are only interested in kind of policy making changes while agencies in most OECD countries are uh, on the, the implementation side. And yet missions go beyond that, that missions is a kind of evolving policy that evolves through the implementation, that the kind of the experience from uh, Vinnova, Health Holland, uh, from uh, RSA show us. So we also need to have a kind of different relationship between ministries and agencies who are coordinating them and talking to their motivations as well in the different ways. Yeah, thank you. I think it's interesting what you say there about missions looking slightly different from different perspectives. Well, what's your 
perspective right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in my academic seat, I guess. But um, no, but for me, it's, um, it's really interesting that, um, in all of those uh, examples you have come through and, uh, and uh, experiences we are, we are gathering also outside of these uh, uh, workshops and seminars, of course, is that admissions are really forcing governments to think about sort of not only just new ways of doing things, but also new ways of gathering information and understanding information out there, which I think is really relevant. And I think uh, Mariana asks uh, in a, in a Q&A, there's a question, how do we make sure that this knowledge that is emerging in those, you know, trying to do mission-oriented policies, how do we make sure? And, and, I, and I think this is, this is really a really important question because I think governments otherwise very easily revert to, you know, their usual Excel sheets and, um, and you know, statistics and then trying to show that this is what happens and of course they are under pressure as well so but i think mission oriented approach allows you or provides you with this approach to be much more cranial and in a way if you have this uh, long-term goal and you're able to frame it in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way that people understand what you're trying to do changing the streets changing the way we eat things like that i think it, it has a very powerful uh you know, influence on the, the entire way we actually understand the impact of government's activities. And, and, and this, I think, is really the, for me, the most interesting, perhaps, is long-term change that we have to undergo of developing new methodologies of analyzing and understanding policy, but also engaging with the, with the citizens that we can't just rely on, you know, electoral cycles and things like that, or organized interests that we're, you know, we come from 20th century where everything was large scale, you know, parties were so big and they organized society's interest, for instance, especially in the European context. So that we, we can't rely on that anymore. We, we go into a much more a, a, a granular world, if you will, and how you get the input from, uh, from, uh, from businesses, universities, people, it becomes more and more relevant, I think. Thank you. Um... One more question that emerged from the bootcamp before we go to questions from the audience. In a nutshell, how are mission-oriented policies different from existing policies? Raina, do you want to start or should I jump in? You know, I, I can do a very pretty. I think the, the, the really the key difference from, from mission, for, um, you know, if you, if you look at the normal government policies, are focused on relatively short-term goals because they're, of course, they have to be because there is a political cycle underlying it. So governments usually are focused on three to four-year goals and they are usually quite siloed. So each department, each minister, each organization has their own goals and that they try to um, attain. And I think missions really provide you this way of, of reframing that and saying we actually want to we understand a lot of the problems are actually cross-cutting for government, like climate, for instance, is a cross-cutting problem. So, but we can't just create a, a climate ministry and say oh, all government is a climate ministry. That doesn't work either. So we we create we can't just create homogenous organizations. So we have to rethink the way we we sort of we think about policy goals. And this is what missions offer you is, is to reframe of, of what do we want to actually achieve as a policy goal that can be quite long term it can be by 2050 but it provides us this way of a roadmap of working together towards that goal over a longer period of time would be my answer yeah I, i'm maybe going to come up with a controversial uh, explanation but uh... I think that uh, our current structures in government are the results of previous missions. And some of these missions go back to the 19th century, the 20th, mid 20th century and, and so beyond. So our structures in government, our ministries and structures have been built by previous missions, reconstruction after the, uh, after the Second World War, kind of supporting the nuclear family and, uh, and uh, all the security systems that are built up for a certain type of economy. Why we actually need missions now and consciously need to think about that, that we are in the midst of a paradigmatic change in terms of you know, entering a kind of digital society and we are uh, continuously kind of looking for a new model, which also means that our problems and challenges are considerably different from before. So we are also kind of facing this dissatisfaction with how government is delivering. So I think that the mission approach is extremely useful to actually setting up uh, challenges 
by which we can actually build new types of government structures that are based on what we find important or how we live our lives or what kind of social security or welfare we now need coming out from one system and one paradigm to another paradigm. And I think that's why this kind of free, uh, like missions is a reframing tool to reach the kind of 21st century uh, goals and uh, kind of solve 21st century problems that we're facing as well is extremely important. Well, that's very interesting because so one of the audience members, Maritia Mofka asks, based on your analysis today, how often are missions still set at a policy specific area versus an overall policy strategy? Mm. Yeah, I think you have you have both, but I think it and it depends really on the context. So so you have a. I think in the in the European context, you have a lot of that is still happening on the on the sort of national government level. Uh, but at the same time, you look at countries like New Zealand; it's similar. So you have national government trying to move into well-being agenda. So you have a um, let's say this mega missions almost like climate change, for instance, is for almost all governments. This has become a mission now. So you can't you know you can't do mission oriented innovation. I think without climate change. Today. But then it, the question is, how do you how do you make it work in your own context? Whether it goes through transportation, whether it goes through something else, um, you know, it can be also that public sector itself is just tries to be you know carbon neutral. So it can operationally on, a, on a, in a very different way, and that really depends partially on your capabilities in, in the government um, at the moment, but also on the political will and buy-in, and how much uh, uh, political will at the moment you have as well. Mm -hmm. And I think from my perspective, I fully agree that there is a diverse set of practice at the moment in terms of when, where and who sets the missions uh, and how are they implemented. And I think that the key roles there are, like one of the key sources for national level missions are of course government action plans and government programs. And then the, you know, the, uh, the opportunity or disadvantage there is that sometimes they are defined as missions or sometimes they are designed as kind of outputs or tweaks uh, towards the current system. But these kind of government action plans, government programs as uh, parts of kind of national, you know, uh, even if they're time bound to four to five years, they give a source to missions if they are actually defined very well. And then uh, we also, while we say that for mission oriented approaches, kind of leadership support and top down support is really, really important because it gives license and rule to explore these, but missions can be also created and supported by social movements. So uh, what becomes important to a politician is something that is on the hearts and minds of the people. So if you have Greta Thunberg or others uh, really kind of changing the value set or setting uh, certain topics on the minds of politicians, these can quickly become something that the governments have to deal with as well. And of course, the current crisis, I think, has set several missions for governments if they asked, wanted, or even were interested about this. So there are various sources of where it can come from and also where they can also be led from. Interesting that you mentioned um, the role of civil society. Uh, one of the audience members, Gaspar Kramer, asks, how do you believe that civil society organizations can drive mission-oriented innovation? What is their role? Rainer? Yeah, I think I, uh, yeah, I think he asked the same question twice, or, or similar question, so I answered it uh, in a written, but that's that's fine. I think it's, as I said in, the, in my written answer, I think it's probably impossible today to do mission-oriented innovation without some form of civil society organizations being quite heavily engaged because of the long-term commitment that missions represent and that they are this, you know, longer than political cycles. So you have to have some sort of support in society that is just larger than political leadership or, or parties. So in that sense, I think uh, it really matters greatly that you're able to tap into that. And that's why I think it's it's probably not a um, not a surprising that we've seen in quite strong democracies. We see missions becoming a really relevant, like you know Sweden or Denmark or other places, where you have a strong civil society actors as well that, that you can rely on that, that they are representing voices in a, in a quite wide sense as well. But at the same time, I think it's also um, you know we see in the in the COVID connection uh, as well how countries are 
are needing to rely on the, on the buy-in from the citizen and civil societies as well to, to actually attempt to change, you know, you know, build back better, rely, you know, you need to have some sort of support for that as well. Otherwise you can't do that. So I think civil society is like super important for, for that. I think that there may also be very big differences between countries where you have also very strong philanthropies and uh, think tanks and support structures versus others where this funding for civil society is public sector dependent, which also is the case in some cases in OECD countries. Uh, because of, of course, the ability to carry over a mission from one political coalition to another one or keep that you know, fire burning for civil society is dependent on also the resources and access to the resources and who gives them uh, as well. So there are really important uh, factors that are connected to that and also worth exploring in terms of how to build those partnerships and how to build that kind of long term time frame where uh, you have partners who uh, give this kind of different motivation and time frames for us and governments that tend to um, lose a little bit of attention when they enter into election periods or election phases. So these are the kind of the realities of poli uh, political economies that we're dealing with. I think just to, just to quickly comment on that, I think the you know, buy-in for missions is, is so important. So if you engage civil society from the get-go, you get a much stronger buy-in rather than you know selling it later on and, and saying this is our mission. And I think in a way that happens a bit on the EU level. I think that EU because the missions are set on a on a on a quite high commission level. And uh, and I think if you if you today, I mean, I'm not in the European Union sitting at the moment, but I mean, if you are sitting in the European Union and go out to the street, well, which you probably shouldn't do, but if you ask somebody. Do you know any mission from the European Commission? They probably wouldn't know anything. So that, and that's the that's the problem. If you if you then try to have these ambitious policy goals, but nobody really knows about them, it's probably something you know went wrong. And this is where I think civil society engagement, and not just engagement in terms of sharing our plans with, or sending an email link and say you can give us feedback, uh, but rather actually trying to do a, a real engagement is, is so relevant. Mm -hmm. And also kind of tapping into the fact of what, what is really important to the people uh, on the ground. Um, because I think one of the things that people, our policymakers are also struggling with is like, we saw this world crowd emerging that, that we could set 120 missions easy at the moment like in terms of policy priorities. So how am I going to select what, which ones uh, are actually going to be missions? Like what, is, what am I going to pitch to the cabinet uh, or what am I going to build the system up as well? Like how do I make that choice? And there, if you have live in this ivory tower or you only stay inside your administration and you don't collaborate with outside partners, you don't really realize as well what is important or what is possible to achieve or what is the kind of the, where it's possible to actually use the wind of opportunity and spark the process of change. Well, we have a very concrete example from Fermin Cereso Peco, apologies for the pronunciation, from Spain, who have been working on mission oriented RI agenda for a few years. But they ask themselves, should we consider missions that affect competencies outside of the city's control? So other levels of government, regional or country, or should we include certain missions if they are important to citizens and society? Yeah. yeah. I don't, I think it's an excellent question because I mean, a lot of the policymakers, especially on the regional or city level, face exactly this, this kind of uh, challenges that not all the policy levers they own themselves. Some of the funding of infrastructure or even school systems might be federally or a level of uh, national government uh, regulated. And so, but I think at the same time, I don't think it's mutually exclusive at all. I think it's because city at the same time, you know, going back to the last, uh, the issue we discussed is, you know, most most of us actually live in cities. So this is how we ex experience government. This is how you experience public space. What does it mean to have a a public sector provided uh, services? For instance, we 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 experience them through through cities. So I think it's it's uh, it's about framing and uh, and finding a way to actually 
bring those issues together, your challenges on a city level, but also then your 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 tools and your your uh, your civic society as well. And I think that again, coming back to the example, for, for instance, from from Vinova, I think, but also the Health Holland, I think, is very similar. To, so going going to the almost to the street level, as it were. So how do we bring the mission idea to the street level? I think is uh, is in that sense very relevant because this is how we experience, you know public policies, public policies for most people have no meaning whatsoever, but the experience when they go outside, you know, when I go to shop or meet them, but this is how I experience policy reality. So I think that's, um, I think it's, it's, it requires some ingenuity, perhaps, how do you, how do I frame the mission in my city context in a way that it actually leaves me with levers, at the, but at the same time, it is also realistic for the, for the citizen. Mm -hmm. I think this is really connected to like what a lot of innovators within the public sector and policymakers in general has kind of challenged with or are challenged with is the kind of the mandate wars. Like who has actually the mandate and the levers of control? Because you face the same issues within the national governments as well. That you're working on welfare issues, you have to, and these kind of causes and effects are maybe not connected to your own portfolio. So should I actually? you know, define that ambitious mission while like some of these very important factors are not inside of my control. And my simple answer is, of course you should, uh, as long as you care enough. If it's a big enough problem, then of course you should, in a sense that uh, uh, there are also kind of the approaches for innovators to take the mandate, as uh, Reiner was talking about, was the un ingenuity of of creating the networks. So if some of these levers are outside of your control, uh, then uh, go and uh, build and lobby and build relationships with partners who hold those levers. Um, but as long as the mission is coordinated from the most kind of motivated, angry, and uh, you know who really wants to have it achieved. So if you care enough about the problem and it's important in your domain to actually achieve welfare within your city, for example, or security or otherwise, uh, then you should add it as a mission and you should build the networks that actually can deliver uh, on that mission as well. Even if in the beginning, those levers are not in your mandate or in your area of control. So kind of this, uh, we have to really break this um, learned helplessness through the kind of mandates that we own or have within the civil service and public sector as well to really kind of deliver on core problems that we're facing today. There would be an interesting um, uh, challenge to this bold thinking comes from Luisa Pinto Rodriguez. She asks, how do we design missions that are brave and ambitious, but also achievable and realistic? So how bold should we go? Oh yeah, I saw that question. It's, it's of course the, um, I don't know how many, how many million dollar, dollar question it is, but, um, but I think the, um, the really the, the question is, is more about the, more about the design. I think, um, you know, governments are, in that sense, always quite good at uh, you know talking to talk, and if, if they realize that this is what is expected from them, we can always call something a mission, and and we can we can try to do it. But it's actually a, how do you become more real about uh, the the mission oriented approach, or or anything like uh, tries to take on the challenges rather than goes goes back to the siloed approach. So I think it's it's so how do you how do you become more realistic in terms of setting the ambition. And that in, in one way is of course depends on the, I think analytical tools you're able to bring to the table as well, or the engagement tools you're bring, able to bring to the table, but also the diversity of perspective you're able to bring. And of course your, your context is also that matters really. I mean, countries, even if you have similar problems, our political and, and our economic context and technological context are so different that you need to be also being able to, to, to design for your, your own context. But at the same time, I think it's um, I think it's really important um, to have this sort of a cross-sectoral mindset because I think it's again it's much more easier to say we want to electrify industry, for instance, because that you know and it is very relevant to do that. Of course, you wish to electrify industry, but again, this is relevant for one sector. It doesn't necessarily perhaps change the way you do policy in that sector because it's just a 
a better better policy for that sector, which is also good. But if you would if you want to bring that together uh, with wider issues that we face uh, from from the way we eat, the way we move, I think you have to go bolder and, and bigger. And that means usually cross sectoral that you that you try to have a mission that is not only for one sector or relevant for one sector or demands something from one sector. So how do I make it cross sectoral? I think it's like a good litmus test where it's ambitious enough. And I think it's, it's also whether it's uh, uncomfortable enough for, for many people, at least initially, it's also a good, good litmus test. And, and also probably the, you know, if somebody says we have no tools how to deal with that, it's also probably a good litmus test and saying that you're actually quite ambitious already. And that then takes the design, you know, you have to be realistic in designing it. Well, I, I slightly am going to disagree on that as well, because uh, <laughs> but Chiara is also cool. laughing, and I think all my team is laughing Good. behind because they all know that uh, I, I do uh, thoroughly like ambition, uh, but uh, I like, in a sense, I like high ambition, but I like realistic ambition in terms of uh, the ability to actually implement. We have great friends in Finland who have said before um, that the great idea uh, implementation is where great ideas go to die. And that's what we're most afraid about the missions as well. Well, is the implementation. So it's easy to be ambitious about where uh, to set mission ambitious, but you also have to start from the fact of analyzing uh, about your capabilities, capacities, and tools and methods and mechanisms that you have. But that shouldn't stop you. In not having them shouldn't stop you because that's the first step. And the second step is how am I going to bring in those capabilities or capacities if I don't have them or build them internally inside government uh, to get to the place where I'm actually able to uh, kind of uh, build the mission the way I want to build it. So this is not kind of a project or a project proposal. I mean, you can set up a hackathon in three months and, and run it in an effective way and do changes based on that. But mission-oriented approach should be kind of a continued evolving approach that also you will have a capacity and capability program connected to that to do that well. But I've not yet met the kind of uh, also these mission um, that we have ongoing missions that didn't have to do capability and capacity planning throughout their work. Uh, Sweden, for example, and Vinnova itself has an innovation management support program where they're actually building a new model to support ecosystems to build uh, uh, mission or missions and actually run those ecosystems to ecosystems to reach those goals. So these are all part of a mission oriented approach uh, in a sense that and from a leadership perspective, uh, you should really uh, give a flexibility in that sense that your goal is to set the mission and really be doggedly about, the, you know, did you actually receive that and asking about that and evaluating on that, but also give the flexibility of resources to say what anything goes uh, in terms of kind of the tools, methods, capacities that I need to build to take that mission to its fulfillment. So I really believe that anything is possible in any conditions, you have to have simply the kind of the right mechanisms and also the implementation plan built in place. In some cases, it requires different types of partners, capabilities and resources uh, and also realistic timeframes. Um, but uh, this is something that uh, if you really care about the problem that you should also commit to that. Uh, one of the listeners has an idea for a very specific um, tool to use. Sanchir Jao Gaussaikan, apologies, um, asks, can you elaborate on the role of anticipatory regulation? for both setting the mission and gaining commitment of different stakeholders. This is in the context of public sector institutions, in most countries being limited to following the rules, regulations, and policies, rather than working with missions. This question is about anticipatory regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe Bert, you want to? take a start since you have one of those facets. It's not specifically anticipatory regulation, but it is anticipatory innovation. Yeah, so we're kind of back in Sweden again. So in, uh, in a week and a half's time, we're actually going to run an anticipatory regulation uh, uh, international workshop with the Comet Committee in Sweden to see how 
uh, kind of uh, regulation or regulatory approaches can actually fit into a different new and innovate uh, kind of you know how can innovators actually take advantage of that uh, so when we have like when we think about our innovation facets model, then actually anticipatory innovation and all the other facets are extremely connected to also missions. And if you run, run those kind of missions as well. So your regulatory framework should give allowance to uh, experimentation and trials and different forms of flexible forms of formatting uh, that are very important to anticipate, like explore problems but are extremely important uh, also in terms of designing dynamic missions. So you may, you know, if you want to um, increase the lifespan of people across different uh, socioeconomic groups as in Holland for five years, you may have to run very uh, different experiments that actually are dealing with kind of core rights of people or current services. So your regulatory framework that you put up in place uh, should actually allow that to happen. And if we're talking about the ethics on some of these experiments, then there should also be mechanisms that allow you to discuss quickly about what are the ethics or norms that we are not crossing, or how should we set up those experiments that contribute to missions, for example. So this is all part of a kind of a mission-oriented support structure that also kind of an anticipatory approach or anticipatory regulatory approach could actually commit to. And of course, World Economic Forum is also doing great work in this space together with the colleagues at the OECD who are looking into the role of regulators and how regulators and how they work should change based on that, become more agile and anticipatory in terms of not only the policy or the regulations they set up, but also how they themselves work. Because if you're setting an up a mission and you're working really, really hard, and then you have this roadblock of a regulation that you can't move, and you're stuck there, and nothing happens, uh, then also the regulators themselves have to be ready to move as fast as you or uh, analyze or tell you why you can't do certain things a certain way, uh, so you can find another way to go on. Uh, we are about 15 minutes away from the end of this webinar, so we'll take maybe one or two more questions from the audience before we wrap it up and talk about the next steps, including the workshop in February. So uh, one more question from um, uh, someone, an anonymous attendee who asks, how can you fight internal resistance in public organizations? What are the best strategies to convince people who are still sticking in the old mindset? I'm not, I, I think it's, a, it's an age old question about bureaucracies, I think, because that's why in, in many ways we have a bureaucracy is to, is, to, is to create those mindsets that don't change very often. And the bureaucracies are there to create this predictability and transparency. But of course, I think the question is, is, is absolutely spot on because you know, many people might en enjoy you know, workshops like this. And, but then they go back to their offices and they can't really change that much either because of their their team members or, or their superiors are not really, you know, not even against, but I mean, if you want to change a lot that, you know, where do you start and how do you start? So I think that the question is whether you start to, you know, showing the, you know, things that work in other places or in your own organization that you have changed and that, that web has applied the mission oriented approach and it has changed and it has worked and it, it's created a, a better outcome or it has created also what in many ways is very important is it's it's a better brand for that organization it can also work uh, really well because you have a better standing in, among your peers you are seen as a good or cool organization that might also work but i think it's also you can also start by by trying to you introduce some of the different tools that perhaps your organization is not used to that are, for instance, from like uh, strategic design uh, or other these kind of tools that maybe are not, you know, in your normal toolbox and trying to, you know, step outside of your, your normal activities, that might be another way. And, but also there might be, we, we talk so much about uh, civic movements, for instance, the civil society, so trying to bring them in, opening up uh, the bureaucracy as it were might also work. Uh, in, in, in generating the, the dynamic or the need for change. 
Uh, but of course, these are always uh, somewhat precarious processes because you know you can't control it. I think this generating or, or folk trying to focus on areas and activities that bring in more of a risk-taking attitude, I think is all in general positive for these kind of changes. So Piret, maybe you want to add. Oh, I think uh, it's a kind of a million, million euro question, a million dollar question as well. It's it's kind of built into the all the change man management and innovation management programs as well. Uh, that usually also paint the uh, public sector as risk averse or civil servants as risk averse and you know bureaucracies for, for bureaucrats' sake. I think what I have experienced in the public sector is that uh, usually people are not mean or they don't want to change. Uh, there are usually very rational reasons why they act the way they act, in a sense that there are feedback systems within your organizations that say that if you take to you know, ambitious goals or you don't have actually resources to fulfill them, you're going to be punished in some way or form by your performance system or your leadership getting scared or any kind of this feedback system that kind of kills off ideas. So that's what we also see with innovators is that like when organizations are actually not supporting this work, they usually last three years and then they go out from public sector because they get so frustrated that they can't do anything. So it's extremely important to actually build support structures for, as Raina said, experimentation, design, and also kind of uh, allowance for trial and error. And, uh, you know, in public sector, failure is a bad word, but in some case, failure as well. And also the ability to uh, build the proof of case, uh, case uh, demonstration cases as well, in the sense that uh, there has to be an ability to, you know, prove that something is possible. And what we've seen is the most kind of, you know, people are scared about change or really resistant to change, then they usually need experience uh, with those methodologies to see that, you know, that everything didn't crash. But of course, there is a very big but there as well, that uh, what is uh, kind of the side effect of missions is that people may understand why missions and new goals are important. It doesn't mean that they are willing to work in that way in the future. So we have analyzed also cases where um, the whole organizations or different welfare systems have gone through a mission oriented change where they also have to, at the end, kind of in the process of it, have to deal with turnovers of 30%, 40% of the people leaving the system because they can't work in a new way or they don't want to work in a way, new way or they're not accustomed to it. So it also is part of the kind of the realistic implementation of missions is that uh, you probably are not going to be able to retrain everybody, but you have to also build up a certain turnover and capacity building and new types of capacity building and to work on those missions. So you're not going to be, you know, um, being or taken off guard by these capacity imbalances that are going to come because your mission is actually forcing you uh, to work in a totally new way that people are not used to. Thank you um, for that, Kurt. I think that really speaks to the efforts that OECD and IAPP are currently making on gathering these mission practices, understanding what it really takes to make the missions workable once public sector organizations have accepted or set a mission. So I think we will um, wrap it up here. Thank you very much everyone for sticking with us for an hour and a half of uh, mission-oriented innovation chat. Um, I see that a few questions were left unanswered. We'll come back to those and online later, and we will also produce a write-up of this webinar. Um, I want to leave you with um, another reminder to sign up uh, on our list if you are working on mission-oriented innovation, and we will get in touch. And we will also probably open a waiting list for the workshops in February in case we have spaces there. Anything you'd like to add, Kurt or Reiner? No, just thanks. Thanks for participating and being so active in the in the chat and questions and uh, fantastic to see. And hopefully see you soon in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
thank you also from me and uh, I hope that we can also commit, co uh, connect on specific and concrete missions on the ground uh, uh, to make their implementation actually possible in real life. So next time maybe a webinar on specific missions and how to f fight the good fight uh, on the ground. Thank you everyone and have a good rest of your day. Bye.